Excellent. So uh, welcome everyone to this uh, roundtable discussion on digital public infrastructure for electoral processes organized by Open Knowledge Foundation and Afro Leadership. Um, I'm Sara Petty, I'm the International Network Lead at Open Knowledge Foundation, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, just a few words uh, about Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, we have a mission to build a world where um, everything is open by design and where knowledge is accessible and creates positive social change. And we do so developing tech tools, uh, standards and harnessing communities uh, globally. So just a few words about digital public infrastructure for electoral processes. Um, this is uh, basically a project that started as an internal discussion within our team. And my colleague, Patricio Del Boca, who's here, um, is the one that sparked that conversation. Uh, he's a senior developer, but he's also um, uh, an activist uh, in, uh, in Argentina, where he's from. Um, and basically, uh, Patricio already worked a lot uh, with elections uh, in the past, and he's going to tell you a bit more about that. Uh, later on. Um, but so this internal discussion very quickly gained traction uh, inside uh, inside the core team of the foundation, and we basically decided that it was worth it to turn it into a project. Um, so at the moment, what we're trying to do is trying to understand what is already out there when it comes to digital public infrastructure, but also like election uh, processes in general. Uh, and mainly we want to understand what are the challenges that are there, uh, what is missing, especially like talking with people that work with elections every day. Uh, we want to understand what are the blockers for them and what would be like useful next steps that we could take all together. So our goal is really to map out what is already out there, uh, the projects uh, and initiatives that um, are already working, and also start a discussion with all of you, um, and hopefully also create connections uh, between, for example, similar initiatives around the globe, but also like um, with all our organizations. Um, as a reminder, this is the third round table on four. Um, basically, we had uh, a first one um, focused on Latin America, then a second one, which was more international, uh, with a focus on uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. And then we're having a third one now for Anglophone Africa, and we're going to have a fourth one next week for Francophone Africa. Um, this discussion is going to last more or less one hour and a half, um, and I just wanted also to give you a quick overview of uh, the structure of it. So we're going to have first an um, introduction or presentation by Patricio, who's going to tell you a bit more uh, about our project on digital public infrastructure for electoral processes. Then uh, after Patricio, we're going to hear from uh, five excellent speakers, and I think they are now all here. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank uh, Amina Miango, who's an expert in election processes from the Nigerian Independent National Electoral Commission, who's here for us today. Um, and also, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Kojo Impraim, who's the Director of Research and Advocacy at Media Foundation West Africa. Um, I wanted to thank Charity Komuzurici, who's Monitoring and Evaluation Coordinator of, at Africa Freedom of Information Center in Uganda. I also wanted to thank Buzomuzi Sifile, who's a journalist and also a program officer at Panos Institute Southern Africa, based in Zambia. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to thank Alfred Bulakali, who's the Regional Director of Article 19 West Africa. And of course, I wanted to thank uh, Charlie Martel as well, who's uh, helped us so, so much to invite all these great speakers uh, to be with us today uh, and for accepting to coordinate uh, with us this uh, two roundtables for Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa. Um, just as a reminder for our speakers, um, I'm going to be quite strict with time, so every one of you will have five, six minutes to present the project, because in the end, we want to allow enough time to have a discussion, maybe take a couple of questions from the audience as well, and really like start maybe creating those connections that I was talking about. Um, Again, this call is recorded. Uh, the link will, uh, we will share the link to the YouTube recording uh, once it is uploaded and share it with all of you so that you can share it with colleagues, friends, family, or whoever you think uh, is, would be interested. But I don't want to steal much more of your time. So I'll just pass it on to Patricio um, so that uh, you can start um, telling everybody about uh, the digital public infrastructure for electoral processes. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Sara, for this like amazing introduction. I'm going to quickly share my screen. OK. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about me and um, my past, uh, as, such as uh, to be a little bit of context of this project. Uh, my name is Patricio Del Boca. I'm an information system engineer from Argentina. 
I'm from Alta Gracia, Cordoba, Argentina, which is like a really small city in the center of Argentina. Um, I have been a lifetime activist uh, and I have been focused on elections, on electoral processes and technology in elections for the last couple, eight years or so. Um, I'm currently working in the Open Knowledge Foundation as a software developer, and I am also part of the core team member of SICAN. So I'm also like doing development there. So um, a little bit before jumping on, on defining which, what is the project that we are launching with the Open Knowledge Foundation, I, I want to give a little bit of context of where it burns, uh, this project. And this project burns, burns in Latin America. Um, in 2019, um, basically, we were like monitoring the elections in Bolivia, and Evo Morales, which was the candidate at that time, needed a 10% of difference in the vote to be able to win without going to a second round. Um, that night, when they were counting the votes, it was like super close uh, but Evo Morales at the end like was able to ar arrive to that 10 percent but before that there was like a huge misinformation campaign about how was statistically unlikely that Evo Morales uh, was going to achieve that 10 percent of difference that he needed um, and this misinformation campaign was fueled by the organization of the American states uh, which an um, infamous PDF uh, that was like a small pre-report and analysis on the elections. So basically, yeah, they went out and communicated. It was unlikely that Evo Morales had this difference. There must be fraud in the elections. And um, the community and the activists and the journalists that were monitoring the elections went out and say, hey, um, where are the data that, that you used to run this report and to give these claims? that data wasn't existent. Uh, they didn't have it, they didn't share it. So it, we were unable to corroborate what they were saying, and we needed to believe in a PDF report saying that it was stati statistically unlikely, and that the report created a, a, a scenario of political instability, a, 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 an arrest in, in country in, that led to like a coup in Bolivia. And then, after that, we started seeing in, 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 in Latin America, which is like the region I, I, I try to work on and monitor, we started seeing similar patterns. Um, and there we started seeing that this happens like everywhere uh, in, in America, uh, in the continent. Um, in Guatemala now, they are having like uh, fraud allegations uh, that threaten democracy. We all knew what happened in the United States with the mob that stormed the Capitol. Um, and then in Brazil as well, we have the same problem. Now in Argentina, we have elections next Sunday, and the one one of the coalitions that is trying to like uh, gain the power is accusing of micro fraud because they are like, stealing votes. So this narrative of fraud uh, is usually widely to to create political instability uh, in the countries, and this all burned. Uh, it's created because of the lack of information and lacks of access of to data to the civil society and journalists. So, so that's the context and that's the idea that we say, okay, we need more information to tackle these misinformation. We, the public, the civil society, journalists, we need to have um, access to this information. Um, and before jumping, one, one last thing. Um, that this kind of disinformation campaigns that are heavily based on like the accusation of fraud um, are highly successful because um, there is a lack of participation, there is a lack of knowledge, and there is generally a lack of information about how democratic processes work. Um, people usually don't know how votes are count, what is the process that runs uh, a country to count the votes. And as people do not know what's going on on an, on an election, they are like, I mean, these campaigns are successful because of that. That's why um, at the Open Knowledge Foundation, we believe that if we have open by design electoral processes, it will bring to the electoral processes several benefits, including, but not limited to, 
One, for example, it will increase the information available to citizens to counter these misinformation campaigns. Um, and second, it will make democracies more participative and therefore less vulnerable. I mean, if we have open by design processes, open software, open data, who will care lame fraud if everyone knows, everyone participates and everyone trusts the system? So open by design uh, can highly create a, a lot of trust uh, in the system. And that's why we started with this um, with this project. Uh, and the project has like a clear vision. Um, our vision is that a digital public infrastructure enables a healthy information ecosystem around electoral processes, which is key to tackle misinformation. Uh, if we have good information, then we have arguments not only to defend democracy, but also to defend the electoral processes and to defend and counteract these misinformation campaigns. So our mission um, in the Open Knowledge Foundation with this project is to create and promote an ecosystem of open data, standards, and open source technologies to make electoral processes more auditable, participatory, with the aim of improving the quality of the democratic life. So that's our vision, that's our mission, but what is our specific goal for like next year? Uh, so next year, and, and this, this is part of what um, Sarah was saying, what are we doing here? We're trying to map what are the current efforts and where are the current people working in, in, in electoral issues. So for 2020-14, we want to create and enable an international coalition to advocate, design, and implement building blocks for a digital public infrastructure for electoral processes that will be reused and shared to make democratic processes more reliable, result, resilient, and transparent. So that's our main goal next year. Uh, we start this by mapping who is working on elections. And next year, we are going to try to kick an initiative and a coalition and an alliance um, to build a digital public infrastructure. But what do we mean with digital public infrastructure? And what do we mean with building blocks? I mean, concretely, what do we want to build with this new alliance? Well, we want to push for electoral data standards. Yes, a data standard for governments to publish all their electoral data, like, for example, districts, uh, polling stations, candidates, results, campaign finances, voter registrations, and so on. I mean, elections has a huge ecosystem of processes and data and information that needs, needs to be open in order to understand better the process. And we want all the data to be released in a standard that will allow civil society to reuse that information uh, in a better way. We want to build uh, APIs for publishing results. Um, this is like an application or an open source web servers that like electoral body governor, electoral bodies in countries can use to publish electoral results uh, in real time uh, during the electoral processes, because a lot of these misinformation campaigns also came because like the, the way in which the results of the election is published is not consistent. And then we want to, of course, keep pushing for open data portals. So open data portals can be repositories for all the historical data of previous elections. To understand elections and results and dynamics of politics inside a country, it's important to have access to the historical results of the election. That information is critical for journalists, for political scientists, to understand votes, um, to create applications based on previous data that then can be reused in new elections. So having open data portals as a main hub for election data is part of our goals. And then Lastly, building blocks like apps and information. Um, whatever app that can be created that helps like tackling misinformation, making the, the process more transparent uh, is in our agenda. So for example, um, we want to have applications so people can understand where they need to go to vote, who are the candidates, um, what are the proposals of the candidates? What are the results in my polling stations? Um, can I navigate like the data on campaign finances? Um, notifications about uh, results, about situations. So uh, we want to create an ecosystem of applications to make democracy a little bit more participatory. Um, and also, we're not only going to build, uh, but also we need to do advocacy. Um, and the advocacy that we are going to do next year is first push, push for open by the signs. 
and currently and the G20 is defining the digital public infrastructure as something that can be open, but we need to be clear that digital public infrastructure needs to be open by design and it cannot be open, it needs to be. Then we need to do advocacy for transparency and electoral processes should be more transparent and participatory. To, un to defend democracy, we need to understand it. We need to do advocacy on an interdisciplinary community. So I'm super happy that today uh, we have a journalist, for example, in the, in the round table, because we know that this is not a fight of technology. I mean, we are not technocrats. Uh, we don't believe that techno technology is going to fix this. Uh, we need data, we need technology, we need journalists, we need political scientists, we need politicians. Uh, we need to create an interdisciplinary community to tackle this project. And lastly, but most important, we need to do advocacy for en enhancing. I mean, and what we need, we mean with this, digital public infrastructure should respect the sovereign decisions of, of electoral processes. Um, so it's not a project about like creating a framework and exporting how to do democracy in your countries, but rather to get these building blocks, these applications, this standard and put it in the table so each country can pick whatever they want to make the democracies better. So it's not about, it's not a project about how you need to run an election, but basically to put the disposals of people running elections, a lot of tools, open tools, uh, for them to improve. And lastly, but not less important, it's not about voting system. This is not about like pushing for technology in the voting. It's not pushing for electoral uh, voting systems. Um, so this go from managing the databases of candidates and policy stations to the publication of a cabinet of results. I mean, we want to implement technology in a lot of stages of the electoral processes, but not in the voting itself. That's up to every country to decide if they have like one ballot, a multiple ballot, electoral voting system. That's not our discussion. Our discussion is how to support the electoral processes and all the other pieces of information and technology. And so to finish, um, open by design, uh, only open by design electoral processes uh, can guarantee uh, accountability, transparency, resiliency, and explainability of the project. And democracies needs to be more participatory and only openness can create the foundation for processes where people can be integrated. I mean, is democracy or counting votes is doing it in secret, then people will never going to be engaged in it and they will never going to be able to defend it because they don't know how it's done. So next steps. I'm going to go quickly through this because Sarah already mentioned a little bit, but we are doing a collaborative mapping. Um, so everyone that is working on elections, um, if you are a journalist, if you are a political scientist, if you are a politician interested in this, or if you have a civil society uh, organization, a project, a technological tool, um, Please let us know. Uh, we are doing a collaborative mapping of this, and we are mapping it under the umbrella of two projects that we have in the Open Knowledge Foundation right now, which is the Global Directory and the Project Repository. The Global Directory is basically a directory of specialists uh, of the open movement. Um, so everyone that wants or wants to like contact a uh, specialist can go to the Global Directory, search by country, by language, by um, by category, which means like area of specialization, or I mean that's if you're a specialist, in, or if you have a project, then nominate it to the project repository, um, which is the same. It's kind of like a repository of a lot of projects. Uh, we are having new categories, which is electoral processes and digital public infrastructure. So please let us know. We're going to map all the initiatives here. And for more information, go to network.okf.org or contact my amazing co-host, Sarah Petty, um, and she will help you to go through the process. And so that's all for me. Uh, that's the initiative that we are running in the Open Knowledge Foundation. So now I'm super eager to learn about you, about all the project. And lastly, um, this is an initiative that we want to be bottom up. Um, so we don't want to say what needs to be done. I'm going to repeat it. Um, we want to learn what the locals are doing and just give power to the locals and or enhance local um, projects more than exporting democracy. Um, so 
with that say, uh, I'm super uh, interested in listening to the speakers today. So thank you. Um, Sara, back to you. Yes, thanks so much, Patricio. Um, that was an excellent introduction, actually. And I propose that maybe uh, in terms of like orders uh, of speakers, we can go in the order that I presented you before. Uh, so Amina, would you like to maybe go first? You should be able to share your screen, but let me know if you can't, in case you want to share slides. Of course, it's not compulsory. No, I'll just speak to um, without sharing, of course. if that's OK. Absolutely. Okay, so it's good to be here. My name is Amina Niango. I work with the Independent National Electoral Commission. And um, I'll basically just, my presentation will be on um, speaking about the journey Nigeria has done so far in uh, introducing technology to our elections. So before now, really, everything was done manually from registration of voters to voting in fact for voting the law specifically prohibited um electronic voting of any kind so um it was in the last maybe two electoral cycles that um we started introducing um technology to um our processes little by little and um the 2023 general elections that just happened earlier in the year it's probably the first time that Nigeria introduced technology in you know, diverse, you know, electoral activities from registration of voters where you could um, pre-register before um, going physically to um, get your biometrics captured. Then uh, we also saw um, the nomination of candidates was done um, through um, digital platforms. And then we also had election proper. We had um, for election proper, we had, um, <laughs> um, you know, transmission of um, of the, of of some aspects of the results on a um uh, on a digital platform, and then we also had uh, registration of um observers uh, of uh, party agents and you know all of that for on digital platform. So, um, and for the first time too, the Electoral Act, uh, we had a new Electoral Act. So the legal framework changed and then it allowed um, voting by any means. Though till now, um, the Independent National Electoral Commission has not explored um, 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 electronic voting yet, but probably in the next electoral cycle, that could be, um, that could form part of um, some of the, um, changes that will happen. Now, despite all these um, changes, uh, you know, we've always had um, some specific problems and uh, this has to do with uh, the uh, digital infrastructure available in Nigeria. There are areas till date that, uh, you know, you go to and there are no mobile networks, not talk of, um, you know, being able to access the internet. So this is a, a very serious problem, you know. And then uh, you also have uh, the literacy levels in Nigeria. You know, yeah, we have a lot of young people that are on social media that are able to access the internet, they are able to access um, um, resources online. But um, there, there's also a large portion of the Nigerian population who are the people that actually vote who are not able to access some of these informations online. And then, uh, of course, uh, the political interference. We can't talk about, you know, the problems with um, um, digital interference without mentioning political interference. Now, basically, what um, INEC has done is uh, we have platforms where on a normal you can, you know, access um, information on diverse um, um, subjects. You have um, um, data about polling units, uh, where to find the polling units, about political parties, their constitutions and manifestos, which are readily available on the INEC website. We, al we also have um, 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 data on candidates for every election, election uh, results and uh, the data on those. And then also, like I uh, mentioned earlier on, you are able to pre-register to vote online and you can find your uh, voter registration details um, online. Now, I agree that there's still enough, a lot to be done 
a look at the um a look at the last election now speaking as a nigerian and not just a staff of the emb uh, speaking as a nigerian one of the main problems we encountered had to do with um the definition of um transmission of results you know and uh, uh, maybe uh, the emb over promised on that but um the pro the issue is there was there was a controversy as what constitutes transmission of results. So um, the EMB will probably do more in the next election cycle to to um, explain and 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 uh, put um, structures in place to make uh, information more readily available. I think um, that's one area that the EMB um, has struggled with. The issue of um, voter education, putting out its policies in ways that could be understood, and I think it's a it's a problem of um, um, introducing policies that are not very uh, um, compliant with the Nigerian uh, situation. So um, the EMB will definitely do more in that regard. Um, I think basically um, this is um, what I've presented at least. For now, Nigeria is gradually moving towards um, 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 introducing a lot of um, technology into the electoral process. The 2023 elections, of course, was just a beginning. And with time, we'll definitely do more. And um, this platform is something that would definitely benefit Nigeria. And I'm looking forward to participating more in that, at least as a country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amin, and thanks for giving us a very general overview of Nigeria as well. That's going to be very useful for the discussion after. But let's move now to Dr. Kojo in Prime. Right. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to present a slide, but I'll speak to the issues uh, as perfect. they are <laughs> right I thought I should set a little bit of context, you know. So in Ghana, um, the issue of digital public infrastructure um, is gaining currency uh, in the last few elections. Uh, before that, we have two key institutions. One is the Electoral Commission that has the statutory mandate in conducting credible elections in Ghana. And then we also have what we call the National Communication Authority that is um, putting together a voter, um, a national ID card for Ghanaians. There have been a discussion how um, the Electoral Commission can draw uh, its data from the National Communication Authority because the ECOWAS card uh, is supposed to be the master card and therefore uh, letter commission had to rely on that. That debate has been going on for some time now. The political parties have been able to come to a consensus because of some perceived um, trust issue uh, when it comes to conduct of elections and when it comes to uh, state uh, legitimacy and citizen trust in the public institution. So that is an issue that uh, I believe still had to be sorted out. Um, we used to practice uh, manual voting and verification and until 2012 uh, when we introduced the biometric voter registration as a pilot project uh, we were confronted with a number of issues especially when it came to the transmission of result uh, the two major political parties in ghana which is the national democratic congress and the new patriotic party had issues when it came to the transmission of that result in 2012. Uh, we were told that there was um, a Israeli company that was uh, engaged in uh, devising or, or in, in implementing that device and therefore some suspicion around. No wonder we had to go to the Supreme Court to determine a verdict in that election. The other issue concerning the biometric voter registration is how it's been done when it comes to the strongholds of these two major political parties. They have been suspicion that sometimes it is used to either undercut one political party or the other. Uh, now, the Electoral Commission has made 
the ID card as a mandatory requirement that you need to register and have your database uh, uh, into, have your details, sorry, into their database. When it comes to technology, I share with a Nigerian uh, uh, a presenter issued about internet connectivity um, is quite uh, a problem when it comes to the countryside of, of, of Ghana. You know, so whilst we're en encouraging digital inclusion, it does seem quite a number of voters are also excluded when it comes to data because of internet connectivity, it, it, because of assets. Even in the major city, we still have the, the telcos unable to sometimes sustain the connectivity throughout. So there's a problem with that. The other thing we are seeing when it comes to digital infrastructure and electric processes is the inclusion of citizens in the policy making processes. Once again, it does seem to us that all these are talked through from the supply side of governance and the demand side with the citizens are really not involved in the decision making processes regarding the technology architecture around elections. You know, so you'll be there and the Natal Commission will announce to you they are introducing this device or they are introducing this software or this platform. You may only have few political actors getting involved, but the extent to the civil society, the media and the voters play a key role in formulating these policies have always been a question that we have to engage. You know, so the inclusion is an issue that we have to look at it. Also, some issue around privacy when it comes to um, uh, deploying this infrastructure for ICT, we have to engage. We have issue when it comes to transmission of the resort itself. Always on the election day, because of the perceived mistrust in the electoral commission, perceived mistrust in the security apparatus, and the perceived mistrust between among the political party themselves, citizens don't seem to attract the, the results that are transmitted from the polling station to the electoral commission for co collation and for declaration and stuff like that. So it's something that we have to be confronted with and then make sure that citizens have trust in the state institutions, particularly the electoral commission that had a mandate in conducting credible elections, right? In Ghana, we also have what we call inter-party advisory committee. That's a consensus platform between the, or among the political parties. This platform seems not to be working for some time now. And that depends the issue of mistrust of citizens in the electoral process. Just, just by a figure, in the last election, 2020, uh, the electoral commission has to deploy some 75,000 biometric voter registration devices as a way of making sure that we are lifting up our game when it comes to deploying technology for elections. They are able to introduce some facial recognition in that software so that it enhances the credibility of the, the register, the voter register. There are so many a feature that is also added to that, all in the name of ensure that the register is more credible to conduct a credible election in Ghana. Um, so when it comes to other issues of how tech has engaged women in that space, the youth in that space, the vulnerable, I think we have to do more because the discussion always is about the educated class. And even to extend where the educated class, when it comes to demand side of governance, are involved in these processes, uh, we need to do more. Because once again, as I, it is more from the supply side of governance, the institution that are mandated, and they think that everything could be loaded on the voter without uh, our input into that process. And making the tech platform is more consultative, it's more adaptive to our environment. Uh, when it comes to Media Foundation for West Africa and what we are doing in this space, of course, since 2012, we've been doing work on when it, when it comes to monitoring campaign messaging and issue of interpret language and um, hate speech by political commentators. 
and to the extent that we rank them on media platforms. So there's a ranking, and it could tell you that this uh, political party is performing so abysmally when it comes to interpret language, or this party is doing so well. And we don't end it there. We do naming and shaming to ensure the political party begin to uh, put up decent language when it comes to campaigning. They put up decent decorum and posturing in the election uh, architecture and election space. Um, we also have an intervention on misinformation and disinformation. And the first person to talk about it, you know, the issue is how the political party are able to spin misinformation to the advantage. And we are beginning to train the media, the journalists, to use their platform to disabuse uh, and to discredit any unhealthy messaging that come from the political parties. Of course, the bigger issue that we are confronting with that space is media ownership, you know, which is largely in the hands of political parties. And therefore, there's a discussion how uh, the media could have its own independence and credibility because the political party have a heavy hands when it comes to ownership and, and, and the regulation. There are two bodies here. Uh, one, as, as I mentioned, the National Communication Authority give the license to any prospective person to open a media outlet. And we also have the National Communication Authority that is mandated to regulate the content and ensure that there's decency. But these two bodies over the time have not able to work effectively. So that's an area that we have to look at it. Few more things, one more thing as I conclude. I don't exactly, just, because your time is almost over, so Yes, yeah, so one more thing, one up. minute that I'm concluding. <laughs> so yes, we also have two elections, which is the national election and the district assembly elections. The national elections are partisan and the district is non-partisan. You know, so as I speak, uh, coming 9th, 17th December, we are having an election at the local level, and we are doing a number of advocacy public forum to educate Ghanaians in that space. I would like to end here, and maybe follow-up question will help me to explain more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kojo. That was super, super interesting. And I think between your presentation and Amina's presentation already, we have some pinpoints that we already have there. So we have like the internet infrastructure, of course, trust in the electoral processes, education. Um, you mentioned this project on the index. Um, it would be very nice if you could share some links uh, in the chat so we can have a look. But let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Charity Kamujunzi. Um, are you ready to go? Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I would like to share my screen at some point, but also uh, to start with, uh, introduce myself once again uh, from the Africa Freedom of Information Center. Uh, that is, uh, Af AFIC is uh, a continental uh, network organization with 51 members across Africa. And uh, we broadly promote the right of access to information and uh, access to information in the electoral processes is one of the areas that we have focused on uh, the last five years. Uh, at AFIC, we have uh, broadly done three projects and uh, um, election processes. Uh, but briefly, before I talk about those projects, I would want to give uh, like a context uh, of electoral processes in Uganda. Uh, uh, specifically looking at uh, the, the recent uh, 2021 elections. Uh, in Uganda, as a government, um, they're trying to promote technology in election processes. Uh, they adopted use of biometrics, uh, but to cut the story short, uh, this worked during the voter registration processes until the election day, uh, where it was not working. So. Uh, from our thinking, uh, we thought perhaps it could have been deliberate uh, or, or maybe the networks failed because uh, during the election process, uh, we also had uh, internet shutdowns. Perhaps that could also have been uh, one of the reasons that um, maybe uh, it could not work. Uh, but um, uh, from the projects that we have done, I would wish to share, um, wish to share, let me see. 
for the files to share a link. I don't seem to get it. How do I share that, Sarah? I think at help? the bottom, um, you should have um, a kind of like arrow and it says like share screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes, I see, but it's giving me a different screen than I would like to share. Uh, I think you can pick possibly. So for example, if you click on it, then it should say, basically it will give you the options of either. Ah, yes, now we see it. So this is not the link. This is not oh. what I want to share actually. I would like to share. Oops. Try to the share again. I, I can share if you, I mean, if you cannot, I can share the link that you sent me. Uh, but maybe sure. try to sh open the link uh, in the browser and then share the, the browser, if that the makes browser. sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can help. Yeah. Think this is it. Yes. Okay, you can see my screen now. Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Uh, so uh, specifically coming to to this is a project where we used um, technology, and uh, this project focused at uh, monitoring uh, election violence. Uh, why we chose election violence uh, is because uh, the previous uh, last three. Uh, elections in Uganda were mostly ca characterized by election violence, and we wanted to, to participate, uh, collect data, and use it to engage and, and also have dialogue with the, the different stakeholders uh, to ensure that uh, the violence is controlled and measures are put in place. Uh, so what we did at TAFIC, um, we selected uh, 63. Uh, districts uh, out of uh, 132 districts in the country, uh, we selected uh, what we called uh, election uh, monitors in these different uh, districts. We trained them and uh, want to be an election monitor, had to be able to speak English, can read, and also uh, had a smartphone. Uh, of course, we facilitated them um, uh, with internet, and then uh, we developed an online platform uh, in which the data we collected uh, fed into, and this platform was able to visualize um, and give real-time reports uh, for anyone with that we shared this data with. So um, during that process, uh, before we made this dashboard public, actually uh, the violence was very intense and uh, even our donors advised us not to share. So it was not public. It's until recent when we are sharing it uh, after post the elections because um, there were so many risks, um, scared uh, of the organization being attacked or the individuals being hunted down by the state. So we kept this private, but the reports that were generated were being shared by um, key stakeholders like the donors, the international community, among others. Uh, from this dashboard, so I'll take you through the process. Uh, each person um, of each, each trained uh, community monitor in their districts, wherever they would identify any violence, uh, be it a killing, be it um, uh, a beating or any um, uh, mass, you know, any violence around that was sparked by elections, be it a campaign or anyone, they would take a picture, record a video, or write a report and send it in. And how uh, we verified uh, this data is that we didn't post or communicate this uh, report until we verified the sources from three, at least minimum of three persons giving the same report about the incident. So that is how we ensured uh, that the data that was coming from us or to us was actually uh, not, was authentic. So we had to have a, a three uh, persons verification and, and ensuring that it was, it was uh, uh, correct. 
So from here, you'd uh, from our dashboard, uh, whoever had access, you'd be able to tell uh, which districts had uh, the most, where violence was more. The thicker or the darker the color was, uh, the more incident is, uh, incidents happened uh, across the country. As you see uh, the map, if you see this region, uh, this was the Eastern region, uh, there were more incidents compared to the rest where it is light, there were less. And then our online dashboard would also be able to, to make an analysis and uh, track how many incidents were registered. Uh, for example, uh, within um, from uh, January to until uh, first December of the following year, were able to register 1,185, uh, okay. That number you can see from here, uh, incidents across uh, the different areas. And, and this was only in 63, uh, the districts. So uh, these were from uh, 1,700 uh, reports. Uh, these included murders and attempted murders and uh, uh, from this, uh, we actually uh, verified 261 murders, uh, much as the state uh, reported the last number, but for us, we had evidence of, of this much uh, that we could actually uh, share. So this platform was able to give us uh, real-time data because it came in. Um, every time it happened, our monitor in that area was able to share it. Uh, we had someone, uh, we had two staff, who are working on this uh, all the time to ensure that uh, every every uh, not a report would be worked on within an hour. It would not take a day without uh, updating the report. Uh, the same uh, platform would also be able to analyze and show us, uh, give us reports uh, on perpetrators. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, uh, the highest perpetrators were actually uh, the police uh, with uh, 41 uh, percent of the incident is, incidents being triggered by them. And the other one was um, the military, uh, followed by uh, the supporters of the candidates themselves, uh, sometimes the community monitors, so uh, this platform was able to, to tell us, so these were the different indicators that we fed it, and it would tell us what is happening by who, when, and this was uh, real-time information that helped us uh, engage. Uh, using this report, we actually saw, um, over time, we actually saw different engagements happen uh, along the way. I think the government kept wondering who was feeding other stakeholders with this kind of information. But we saw um, the media reporting uh, different engagements happening between the donors and our donor was one of them pushing for uh, for seizing the, the violence and, and, and controlling arrests and things like that. We saw this happen um, um, every time we gave a report. And also at some point, we also saw uh, the president actually came out to give uh, a public speech uh, about uh, what the military was doing and, 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 and calling the military not to shoot at people and also um, asking the responsible persons to actually arrest those who are responsible uh, for shooting the people. Of course, uh, the action taken is different from what was communicated. That's a story of another day. But we saw that the data uh, that we collected was actually uh, informing uh, the electoral processes within uh, the country. Not to the level we wished, but we saw at least uh, something being done. And, and we believe that actually having data would actually uh, inform and influence uh, these processes. Uh, we were able at least to, to verify that that happened. I uh, just wanted same... to say that your time is running out, so start wrapping up if possible. <laughs> okay, Thanks. so the same would also tell us, of course, uh, the kind of victims that were mostly affected, of course, the highest being the voters, uh, the political party players. And uh, if you went, if you wanted the details uh, of exactly what happened, uh, the same dashboard was able to give you uh, this kind of report. Uh, so we used um, uh, 
technology, uh, of course, it was not working alone. We had people feeding in the data and we had uh, quality control mechanisms and this data was able to influence um, uh, the processes uh, during the elections. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarity. And sorry to have to cut you up, but we want to have enough time at the end also to have a little discussion. This is a very excellent tool. If you could share maybe the link with um, all the audience in the chat, I think a lot of people would love to have a look at it. Uh, but okay. let's move on um, to Vosomu de Sifile now. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, thanks uh, to the colleagues that have uh, uh, spoken uh, ahead of me. I think uh, there are many uh, great insights that I will uh, write on. And uh, in as much as most of these are in different countries, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, relationship with our experience. So for those that I'm interacting with for the first time, I'm Vusumu Zisifile. I'm the Executive Director of Panos Institute uh, Southern Africa which is a regional communication for development organization that is uh, based in Lusaka, Zambia, but working across uh, Southern Africa. Uh, and our work uh, is around amplifying uh, voices of poor and marginalized communities uh, to drive the development agenda whilst uh, enjoying their basic uh, human rights. So uh, PANOS works uh, in a number of uh, uh, thematic areas. And I think... Uh, for the purposes of uh, this discussion, I will speak a lot uh, on the work that we do around uh, uh, around uh, elections. And uh, I think over the past 10, uh, more than 10 years, um, we have uh, been working uh, a lot uh, around the uh, electoral processes across the Southern Africa region. And of course, with our activities mo being most pronounced in Zambia, where we are we are best. And I think maybe just to agree with colleagues who spoke uh, earlier, that we are currently in a time where there is uh, increased uh, 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 progress or increased use of uh, digital uh, tools uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, for managing the elections, uh, whether it's a voter registration, uh, regi a verification of voters, uh, the actual management of the electoral processes, uh, results management, transmission, and stuff. You see that there is a lot of uh, deployment of different kinds of uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructure. But also, as colleagues uh, already mentioned, you find that uh, there are still a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the accessibility of that digital uh, infrastructure, in terms of the affordability, uh, of the infrastructure and also in terms of the capacities of uh, different actors to effectively uh, use uh, the digital uh, public uh, in infrastructure around uh, elections. There is also, I think, one um, other challenge which we have observed, which is the issue of trust. So it will be an issue of trust, uh, trusting the technology itself uh, if it has the capability to do what uh, we want it to do, but also trusting the people who manage uh, the technology, because technology, for it to function, there needs to be people, uh, the human in the loop. And in most cases, you'd see that there are certain problems or disputes that arise from just lack of trust uh, in the people who operate technology. And that's why at times, even if the results are transmitted with technology, we still need to see the physical ballot box, we open it and we physically count them because of those uh, trust uh, uh, of those trust uh, issues. So uh, at Panos, because we are a communication for development uh, organization, our work around uh, elections has really been uh, around facilitating access to and uh, use of electoral Im uh, information ensuring that different electoral actors, whether voters, agents, uh, candidates, political parties, election management bodies, they have access to information that will inform their participation in the, uh, in, in the electoral process, and then also equipped to use uh, uh, digital uh, tools 
uh, to play uh, that role. And I'll just quickly share uh, maybe about some of our recent uh, interventions that we have done uh, around the space. Uh, the first one, which uh, uh, Charity did touch on a bit, was a collaboration with the AFIC, the Africa Freedom of Information Center, which was really focusing on um, access to information uh, and elections, where, as you know, that uh, the African Union uh, Commission, uh, they are guidelines, uh, specific guidelines on uh, access to information uh, and elections in Africa, which gives specific uh, re uh, responsibilities to election management bodies and other actors uh, to respond to requests for information on time and also in a, uh, in, in the manner that is classified or de uh, defined in the in the different laws. So we, uh, okay, I will not burden you by repeating what Charity already uh, mentioned. Then also we, uh, also implemented a project which was called the Zambia Elections Information Center, which is a multi-stakeholder technology-based uh, initiative where citizens were able to use digital tools to identify mostly electoral malpractices and report them so that we facilitate speedy responses or speedy uh, resolution of uh, challenges or gaps that were identified by citizens. That was in the 2016 uh, general uh, elections in Zambia. And then during the 2021 general elections in Zambia, we deployed two major technology-based uh, projects. Uh, the first one was something that uh, we called Zikolatu, which basically means our country or our nation uh, in the uh, is from one of the local Zambian uh, languages. And this was a crowdsourcing electoral accountability intervention where on one end, we were monitoring uh, progress, like maybe just documenting electoral uh, promises uh, that were being made, documenting uh, maybe the rollout of different uh, electoral uh, uh, processes, uh, the steps being taken by different actors, but also using that to flag uh, any malpractices, uh, issues of violence uh, and other developments that could compromise the integrity of the elections. Then we also implemented what we called the I Verify Zambia Fact Checking and Response uh, Mechanism. So this was responding to the proliferation of uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation, where we are uh, seeing a lot of abuse and misuse of uh, digital platforms uh, to churn out uh, misleading and harmful content, content that threatens the integrity of uh, electoral processes, uh, it threatens the integrity of electoral actors, whether it's the election management body, it's the candidates and the other actors. So we developed this uh, platform, firstly to identify this misleading and harmful content. Uh, we fact check it, we verify it, but most importantly, uh, so fact checking is not an end in itself. Uh, so in the I verify mechanism, fact checking is really like a means to an end and the end has to be a response being taken by the relevant uh, authorities. It could be maybe by the police, it could be by the election management body, correcting uh, or addressing certain things, uh, certain uh, situations that would have been uh, identified during the fact checking uh, process, uh, processes or addressing gaps that um, we would have uh, identified. So in all this, uh, you will see that uh, basically, uh, Issues uh, like uh, it's a fact that we cannot dispute and that we cannot run away from uh, that uh, digital public infrastructure. This is a very timely uh, uh, discussion because uh, it is no longer possible for us to discuss elections uh, in Africa and elsewhere without looking at the the role uh, of technology. There is no aspect uh, of uh, the elections that. Uh, does not uh, rely uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, to that, that does not rely on on technology, and we have also seen uh, that uh, issues of uh, awareness because technology is developing very fast, but I think our ability to harness it is a bit slow, and that is why uh, it is good that we are having this discussion so that even as different stakeholders, then we are able to move faster and more efficiently 
uh, than we we have done. I think I will pause here and then uh, I'll gladly respond to any questions. Thank you. I'm impressed that I stopped it before you could interrupt me. Exactly. Thanks, Muzumuzi. That was great. I just unmuted myself to say that your time was over and then you ended up fantastic. Um, I think before, I mean, let's pause this, the um, questions and everything. We'll have all of them uh, later on. Uh, let's hear maybe uh, from our last speaker today, Alfred Bulakali, um, who will share a little bit about what Article 19 is doing in West Africa. Thank you, Sarah, to give me the floor. I want to apologize first because I can't show my camera. I have some issue with it, but uh, hopefully colleagues can um, can uh, catch my voice. Yeah, so no I want about to, that. Yeah, let me welcome this opportunity you created to put actors together to share their experiences and also the opportunity you created to meet uh, some fellow colleagues you didn't see months or years ago. So, Visumizi, hi. <laughs> yes, my, my, my brother. Okay, we we'll, we'll greet each other nicely after the after the meeting. I'm so happy that we are here. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's like I always have to speak after you, and it's never <laughs> easier for me to speak when you have you, spoken. You're you stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I extend my greetings to all other speakers and participants. So, um. I won't speak much about technology because colleagues have spoken about it with uh, advantages and um, and um, inconvenience or limitations. But um, I want maybe to 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 plug some uh, one or two challenges that were mentioned within the use of uh, technology. One is. Uh, Although all advantages we saw, something we have been experiencing these last uh, times is also the use of technology again as the election itself. And I want to mention uh, the role social media are playing in, um, in spreading disinformation, being political disinformation, or even citizen disinformation and how it affects the quality of election when it comes for voters to make their decision, sometimes based on wrong information received. And this is a role of uh, technology itself. The other issue to was pointed, but not longly, is um, media. Media themselves being um, migrating to technology and the issue that uh, who is controlling media what type of media have the capacity to, to migrate very fast to technology and make their owners take advantage of themselves using uh, traditional uh, channels of communication and technology also. What we realize in uh, our West Africa region is um, mostly that media belong to these politicians themselves or influences that are uh, in the corridors of power, meaning that when it comes to use the benefit of this media that have capacity to extend to technology, the main beneficiaries will be, will be the, the politicians themselves. And as we say, media, social media and part of technology can be used for uh, serving wrongly election process themselves. That comes to appear more when it comes to the question to whom belong the media the, themselves. So I wanted to add that part of work we, we, we are doing in the region and especially here in Senegal and Gambia that where we have offices is, um, <clears throat> is globally to, to make sure that um, all parts of the population are uh, taking benefit of election, meaning uh, positive and active participatory with uh, focus uh, especially on women and also on young people to make sure they are informed about the processes and also that they are informed about the legal framework and the particularities that uh, can be created for them to fully participate. 
So we've been um, in some election here in Senegal and Gambia facilitating platforms for women to, to discuss the electoral issues and also to, to better be informed on it and how they can positively participate. And of course, what the law plans for women participation for young people participation and other categories like uh, people with disabilities. We didn't uh, use much technology, but let's say that uh, social media are one of the, of the communication tools we use in engaging these groups around, um, around the process. Second thing we, we've been doing is uh, like the colleague of AFIC presented it, is to track access to information throughout the process. And I want to come to the first speaker who very clearly explained the role of technology in accessing to information on elections. And uh, this is one of the issues we've been exploring because as uh, Visumizi also added, the states and the electoral commissions are fast to integrate technology in the process, but as civil society, we are behind in uh, tracking the nature of information that is being created, generated by this technology infrastructure. And if we are behind that, uh, that means also consequently the population themselves are, uh, are not very well informed about it, being the use, the importance, the, 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 the information generated what creates a lot of uh, frustration and uh, mistrust around the process. I go out of this region to speak about the DRC where I am from, where I remember in the previous election where they used for the, for the first time the voting machine that there was a slogan in the country saying, machine to cheat, not machine to vote. And that is information took a lot of space until when it came to count the votes, it was, yes, maybe electronically done, but mostly manually. And at the end, no one can save the results that were published were the results issued by the digital system or those counted manually or the one created by the commission. All those theories circulated around the process and around the election, meaning that there is this problem of trust that goes with other, a lot of issues that were, um, were uh, well described by colleagues, including the literacy level and uh, others. But one of the remedy to that is what the first speaker said, an approach that used the uh, entire disciplinary means, meaning that those, for example, working on, um, on uh, digital infrastructure and us coming behind, we can have a complementary approach. So as a civil society, we take this opportunity and we go better to the citizen to make sure the process is fair, is transparent, the access to information is, uh, is flowing. Now coming to this uh, access to information tracking through the process. More recently, we worked with uh, partners, including the Center for Human Rights of, uh, of the University of Pretoria to track the access to information through the last uh, presidential election in the Gambia. Of course, as I said, I won't come back a lot on the, on the digital infrastructure and technology, but one thing we, we realized, and that is common to a lot of countries, uh, is, um, is that there is trend for the, 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 the institution in charge of election and even the political actors to, to take, their own uh, their own campaign call to vote as the the requirement needed for access to information while it is the whole process to assess as per the guidelines on access to information and elections in our, in, in Africa I, re, I, I, I have to know that access to information is uh, really the key asset a citizen needs to exercise 
its political participation beyond other rights like economic and social and social ones and about seven treaties in Africa guarantee this access to information uh, rights. Now, what we saw, let me just, uh, I, I won't share the screen, but I can share the link to the reports. What we saw in terms, I won't present every, everything, but- um, Alfred, just to give you a heads up, your time is almost over, so if you can start properly. Yeah, up. I only need one minute sure. to, to give some of the examples. <laughs> On the information that are required to, to disclose, her, we, we, we could not find 20% of them for which the outcome was met. Like the organizational structure of the independent commission, yes, that was uh, disclosed. The strategic plan, it was not fully disclosed. The decision-making process, not fully disclosed. And a lot of gaps around matters like uh, procurement, matters like uh, data on, um, on the commissioners of the commission itself, matters like the annual report of the commission itself. A lot of things are not uh, disclosed, meaning the access to information through the process is very low. Even when these institutions have websites and so on, and can have uh, digital uh, means to use, they are not using it them fully when it comes to account and to be transparent around the, the process. So I stopped by here and uh, maybe through questions, I can um, have a more angry discussions with participants and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfred. And if you want to share the links to those reports in the chat, I think everyone would appreciate to have a look. Uh, yeah. But now let's open the floors to questions or feedback or any comment that you may have. Uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and jump on, or you can also raise your hand as you wish. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Afternoon. It's afternoon here, so hopefully this morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Taona, and uh, I I love elections. And uh, pretty much I have been a great follower of uh, digital um, um, infrastructure and electoral processes. And um, I would like to welcome this initiative uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, a platform where um, information is warehoused to the extent to which it becomes easily accessible. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we have, particularly in Southern Africa, where I come from, I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, the, 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 the issue of um, uh, digital infrastructure and elections, in most cases, was and mostly is introduced to remedy issues around electoral integrity. But in most cases, we find that once that is done, there is no ecosystem that supply that 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 supports the transparency on the use of uh, digital technologies in elections. So you would find that uh, most election management bodies in Southern Africa are very reluctant uh, to provide information uh, that sits in their database, be it information on voter registration, be it information on results transmission, and I think. Um, this, I think, is also endemic, not necessarily to Southern Africa, but to other uh, uh, regions of Africa as well. There is that secrecy that surrounds uh, processes uh, that are automated to allow for increased integrity in electoral processes. And I think we have now increasingly seen a process where civil society is coming in to occupy that space and provide those infrastructure that could increase integrity around uh, electoral process. And I actually enjoyed some of the discussions from Alfred, Hosin Mosi, Charity. They also point to uh, a situation where civil society is becoming coming in to occupy that space. And I think this initiative that you guys have actually put in place provides that framework from which we can then be able to warehouse all these initiatives and provide a basis upon which you can be able to hold electoral integrity uh, at the highest level in terms of uh, elections in the regions. So I'm actually very excited. And I think one thing that I wanted also to share is part, partly some of the initiatives that we've also done in Southern Africa. And I'm putting up a link um, around um, 
how we also worked around uh, warehousing information around uh, election dispute resolutions, uh, which is something that has also been used at the elections in Southern Africa to a large extent. Elections are disputed, but ultimately, at the end of the day, there are no infrastructure that can be able to track and follow and see where electoral processes and disputes are going and how they are dispensed of, given the fact that election disputes uh, at the core of some of the issues that we are finding in Africa, particularly for my country, Zimbabwe, where the disputes are now spilling into uh, blood lighting and all those kind of stuff. So I'm very much excited that this initiative is coming through, and I think it will provide a platform from which we can be able to warehouse all this information. And I'm sharing some of the initiatives that we uh, did in Zambia under the election dispute resolution. And I think it's an initiative that also can be duplicated. It can provide a source, and it's an open um, it's an open um, uh, data source that can actually be used in other countries in terms of tracking election dispute uh, uh, resolutions uh, to a large extent. So I just wanted to highlight that that I think for me this is a great initiative, and I think it's something that um, quite a lot of uh, people from where I'm coming from that are involved in elections would jump onto in terms of ensuring uh, electoral integrity is enhanced. Uh, thank you so much for, 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 for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Tawana. That was it's great to hear all of this. And we're really excited that we're causing excitement with this initiative, of course. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, yeah, my name is Kathleen. I'm a good troublemaker from Cameroon. Um, I don't know why I can't see where to... <laughs> Hi, Patricio. I don't know where I, I can't see where to put that, my hand up, so I'm sorry for just jumping. No in. worries, that's perfect. Go ahead. Right, I've been I've been working in civil society um, for the last thirty years, um, and I'm also a part of Afro leadership. So glad that um, Shali Martial is here, um, and I'm also a member of the of AfioNet, which is. A Pan African coordinating platform that links regional citizen observer networks in different regions of, of Africa for, for just good electoral processes and democratic renewal on the continent. And like Tauna said, this is a fantastic initiative. And I think the speakers have also done a fantastic job telling us of the challenges, the overviews and also the initiatives that have come from their work across um, the environments where they are, especially in Anglophone Africa. Francophone Africa is another beast. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking forward to the roundtable three where we are going to really enumerate what is going on in French speaking Africa, just to have the context that will drive, you know, the work that the Open Knowledge Foundation wants to do. I just wanted to bring up something really, really important, which I think we should not um, forget. Um, nearly 3 billion people on the continent remain unconnected. They are hard to reach by traditional media or even the internet. Most of those people are in the global south. Most of them are in Africa. And these people also need to get their voices heard. One of the things that one of the speakers, I think is Wusumus Z talked about was the importance of trust. If you're going to cut those people off, what you're doing is taking away their ability to trust processes. And I think it is really important for us to ensure that everyone deserves access to the information that we want to um, disseminate and so that they are also able to make well-informed decisions on a large scale and on a small scale, okay? And so I'm so glad that this is happening because it gives us the opportunity to enhance the multi-stakeholder coalitions in this initiative that we want to do. We need to take cognizance of the importance of the private sector in this, in this initiative, this project, and also um, anyone that is connected in ensuring that hard to reach people uh, have their voices heard and have access to information. And I know because I have worked with uh, an organization, I'm not going to call their names, who give people access to that information using USSD voice technology. Um, 
And that information is tailored to their individual needs. It is in every single language that they can uh, or that they communicate with, and they do not need to be quote unquote literate to access that information because they access that information with the phones in their pockets. They don't need an internet connection and the information is delivered free. That is because this company, and I think other companies do this as well, also connects with uh, uh, and has partnerships, leverages telecoms partnerships and other international organization partnerships to, in, to ensure that their campaigns are scalable and they have immediate data feedback. I really just wanted to put this in because whether we like it or not, a lot of my grandmother in the village will never be able to afford internet or, and she would just not bother about getting literate enough to go the way I am going on social media. I just wanted us to make a note of that and see how we can, you know, um, enhance that, that area where there's a chunk of people that we need to reach. Thanks so much, Open Knowledge Foundation, for this um, initiative. And I think we are off to the right direction. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And I think it's really interesting, this point that you made. I mean, you were talking about, I think, your grandmother in the village, but that could be said about my mother in my village as well. And I think it's a global problem that we definitely need to tackle. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, Melody, I think you're up next, and then we'll hear from Ibrahim. And Ibrahim might be the last question or comment that we can take, actually, because we're running out of time. But Melody, go ahead. Hi, I'm um, phoning in from the morning time of America. Um, I just wanted to talk. We, I am one of the, um, I guess, advocates for open data in my city. Um, and I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about the structure of how we handle our elections and how um, the government has put into policy where I'm at. This does not happen in every city in America, but it's getting traction more and more to have like open data communication that's available to all citizens and complete transparency. Well, I wouldn't say complete transparency because this is the government, by the way but in transparency enough to show people what our processes are and how we break down um, voting precinct in our city. Um, again, it's based upon a census, it's based upon how many people are in uh, a district compared in, in that breakdown number. It shows us how many um, voting precincts we should open up during election time. Um, the population changes in that area. We adjust it every year. Um, I feel like that's a, it's easier for America sometimes because we do have a lot more access to the internet um, to relay our information. It's just exam, it's an MRI. They go for that. Huh? Sorry, go ahead, Melody. I'm sorry. Um, but we... I just want to like express like the breakdown of why and how we make sure that our government, first of all, has put into policy that transparency in the pro and express the process and breakdown of how the voting process is supposed to go. Um, if we're not on board with it, if we are not leading the charge as a government um, to vote the transparency, it's, it's not gonna happen. We are battling the same misinformation, we're battling news media who's, you know, putting out their story, but the best way to battle that is through government transparency and leading that charge in that for us. And so making sure that we are being more expressive about the policy that we're using and the process that we're using to make sure that everyone has an adequate chance of voting. And our voting is literally going through a booth still right now. We're not doing internet voting or anything like that because again, a lot of people do not trust our, our internet. <laughs> we have that mistrust already. Um, so people are actually manually going out and voting, but because it's a process of a breakdown and, and 
count of, po of the population, we're leading in making sure that everyone has access to a, a voting precinct based upon the population numbers that we have in each breakdown silo of our city. That's just a thought. Thanks, Melody. That was great. Um, if you have some links to share, please do so in the chat. Uh, we would love to have a look at. We would love to have a look at that. Um, Ibrahim, you're up next. We are slightly over time, so if you can stay, maybe another couple of minutes, um, we can hear what Ibrahim has to say. Good afternoon to everybody here, especially to open knowledge information because um, creating this platform or this team it is good for us because it has brought in our knowledge. And especially in the meeting, Sierra Leone, because here, yeah, as some of my colleagues, we are talking about certain things. I think it's also affecting here in Sierra Leone, like um, new stores of information, like uh, voters education, sometimes lacking. And uh, also the media, even during the day of the election, there was a shutdown of the internet. So all this, and we do have um, um, a strong data information here because like uh, after the election, there was the, the citizen demand for the, the, the voter disaggregation by districts. But the, the commissioner, uh, refused to give this one. There was um, a lot of uh, uh, casualty that happened caused by the, the, the police and also the supporters of the, the, the present government, you know. But um, we don't have uh, strong activists there, do they? There are some activists, but we don't have strong activists that are in charge of this one that they are talking about this open data information. So I think it is an opportunity for us and opportunity for me. So I would suggest or recommend that we have a platform. We are all of us here to have a discussion because I think there was no nobody before before now, especially when the election was commenting in Sierra After the election, the European Union and other bodies they they they, they give their recommendation that there are a lot of uh, irregularities and the election was no go according to the supposed to do. So I'll, I'll, I'll recommend that we have a platform we are to discuss issues so that we familiarize uh, ourselves so that whatever happened in Sierra Leone or other country, Africa country, I think we have to communicate it to each other. And I think also this platform, um, uh, I would like Open Foundation to also train us because, you know, in terms of, I want to say, uh, we don't know something about that but if we have um people that will train us in terms of this because we are doing a work you know monitoring you know but we don't have the the capacity you know we don't have the tools to to do this work so i think i'll rest my case here so thank you for giving me the opportunity thanks very much Ibrahim. you were cutting a little bit but i think we got everything that you had to say uh, thank you so much for your intervention i think we have to stop here because we're already four minutes over time but i just wanted to give you give one minute to charlie marcial who helped us organizing this charlie i don't know if you want to just say a word about afro leadership uh, or yourself uh, before closing up yeah thank you uh no it's uh I think uh, it's really an honor to be part of uh, this dynamic and to see all these uh, experts, great experts around electoral issues, you know, uh, sharing their experiences and also showing great passion about, you know, about how we could frame electoral processes in Africa uh, through technology and also through the observation of uh, my electoral technologies as they are being used, you know, um, for diverse purposes in Africa. And I think Patricio <laughs> gave us an example of how uh, technologies might be used during elections. We know they are good sides for using technology. They are also very bad sides. And uh, at times 
we we know good side because most of those who are good people they will talk about the advantages of technology <laughs> but those who use technology with hidden agenda they won't talk about it and i think uh, the process that we are starting now on a continental level is certainly a very wonderful one because it will give us to to put kind of camera CCTV on how technologies are used and also to build a repository where we could see what are the technologies used, how they are used, and also the consequences and impact on several elections. Because I think when information is available, we could actually see how best to make sense of it. And so thank you for that. And Afro Leadership is happy to be part and happy to support any organization and also to share experience and share technologies that are good ones, you know, that the one shares here today, shared here today. And uh, let's build the dynamic, let's build the working group, let's build the network and uh, thanks to all. Thanks very much, Charlie. Thanks again for helping us setting this up. Uh, for anyone here who's francophone, don't forget we have another appointment next week. Uh, so we'd be happy to see you again. Uh, and for all of those who participated today, thank you very much. Special thanks also to our very special speakers. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I wish you a very good rest of the day and we'll be following up with the recording of this uh, and probably a blog as well. Thank you all. Bye. Yes, thank, thank you, you so all. Much, thank you for your time. Bye. Merci. Bye.